Hello, this is Angeline Spignesi, Copley Garden, and I'm continuing my lyrical analysis of Chapter 7 of Jane Eyre. And again, I'll say, quote, end quote, whenever I quote from the novel itself. So we left off where Brocklehurst had entered, noticed Jane, and is about to condemn her uh, for being a liar and punish her. So to continue... Brocklehurst arrives when she is at Lowood, living still out of Gateshead, holding closely, unconsciously, to that which she has denied, split off. She has arrived at Lowood, suppressing her pulse, listening how impulses of fury, yet may be uneducated. She has been very cold here while awaiting the Gateshead fires, all splits, doom, failure, crashed, slate, must always expose its hypocrite. Brocklehurst summons her, and she walks forward, about to comply in the outburst. Hell's fires, lost to his possession, returning her to what was origin. And what I mean by that is that she's about ready to go into hysteria, which would be the Gateshead way of reacting to in, uh, any kind of attack. Okay, anal eroticism. She has told Mr. Lloyd she wanted to leave those reeds, but not for lower relations. She has tried to split from Gateshead in not recognizing those reedian forces, also her own, says they are not her family, yet she hungers in the cold and poverty at Lowood, wants to be fed from without, resists. She had not wanted a lowly life, and she is starving, and as in Gateshead is ready to discharge for their pleasure, her pleasure, the only way she knows of getting heat. So Brocklehurst puts her on the stool in front of everybody and uh, punishes her, says no one's to talk to her for the rest of the day. Jane's first response is impulse of fury against Reed Brocklehurst and company. She is no Helen Burns. Gateshead returns fully visible now, the underside which she feared for and which she longed. On the stool, we are humiliated. Our stool is how we are branded servant of evil one, cast away an alien. It is where we are, what we are, is waste repudiated. If we resist Brocklehurst, our discharge against his sadism, we have become Gateshead. Yet contained in one spot on the stool, throne of stool, within the audience view, makes our potential discharge more conscious and visible. And now we have a luring pleasure-displeasure of discharge while held in one spot. He is who holds us in one spot, requiring we know our difference. We can see ourselves from our audience perspective more than we know our private selves. And now what always has been most private becomes public becomes our increasing sense of otherness, yet through humiliation. Contaminating what is purity, he says, the waters must not stagnate around her. The way she is still fused with Gateshead is the way her stool at Lowood, marked by the evil one, is constricted throat, quote, rising hysteria, end quote. For we are no Helen Burns. None of what is occurring is known, also interior. There is nothing within, no interior light, no way to articulate or even hold the moment. We are no Helen Burns. We will flaunt our resistance, demonstrate in a hysteria, which is a plummeting between our own splits while screaming for her. We had begun to enter a private flock while learning division. And he has come between, branding us alien, quote, not a member of the true flock, end of quote. The moralistic paternal agent repressing our Gateshead sensations is not containing, and the stool is too public as it precludes articulation, results in a hysteria. Rising sensation, stifling breath will burst through what constricts throat. Quote, my dear children, pursued the black marble clergyman with pathos. This is a sad and melancholy occasion, for it becomes my duty to warn you that this girl, who might be one of God's own lambs, is a little castaway, not a member of the true flock. 
but evidently an interloper and an alien, end quote. The only way, he says, we can know difference is to be agent of the evil one. He puts us on a stool for this to be seen bodily. He strikes, quote, be on your guard against her, end quote. Shut her, shun her example, quote, shut her out from your converse, end quote. He is fixed, his marble is black, and is speaking pathos. It is for our own good. The occasion is melancholy. It becomes his duty. At each strike, he is wanting our confession. We are Mark, devil's Mark, mole the dark teat. He whips for all to see a public inquisition, grand inquisition. Sadistic public humiliation. He is flagellating us. We are outside ourselves, most split we condemn and are condemned from the exterior as we redden. Vulnerable and disgraced and simultaneously, we worry about our public view. The gates and concern, how it looks, becomes our humiliation. This way we now perceive from the outside our worry of our public prestige. Difference only to be object discarded, to be seen is to be excluded. That she is seen as being servant of the worse unseen, which makes her the stool carrier of what must remain unconscious. She will hold it so the flock proceeds. The shadows cast by Brocklehurst are of a flagellating man as well as the wife and daughters abundantly arrayed. Such shadows emerge from the naive optimism within a Christianity not promulgated by Christ himself, that we must conquer and ourselves mortify the natural. As he strikes us, the only woman we can see are three wearing an excess of animal fur and feather. We can no longer see Miss Temple. Three women caught in the master's scorn and denial of all they have made themselves to, up to be for him. Three women caught by and dressed for his scrutinizing eye of hate. The hysteric screams. The hysteric scream pronounces loss of temple, Helen Creed, while grasping a drowning in depths, rising to a throat constricted as the stepmother seized a paternal solution, the sadism of which became the return to remain possessed. When the hysteric screams, the witch is being tortured, public accusation, the condemnation, and three women are bonding yet in service to the father, a competition as form of what would be lessons of inhibition, of differentiation, yet not yet of their nature. Three women are acting in a unison feigned as they scrutinize us, one must not get beyond the other, be given more. One must not surpass the other. They act in feigned unison, illusion of our unison, beneath suspicion, envy tears at those bowels, long coils of fur wrapped. Three women bonded as they serve the father and alongside the hysteric screams, the witch is being tortured. She has gone to a school of women and finally, she has begun to learn of a natural inhibition, gentle curbing force here spoken as creed. Woman knowing their containment in convent, curl, beginning to learn the lessons. But there have been the long Gateshead years, three women still in an autocratic rule of a father, self-sufficient only desire, their only advancement. We cannot enter Lowood until we are mortified of some of the gates head layers. The humiliation summons such mortification, yet we resist it in the gates head mode. We will slap the other back. On the stool, we are no Helen Burns. We do not know how to begin to describe what we are experiencing. No light shed on what would be interior to language it, even as we begin to know we exist distinct entity. When Brocklehurst announces our mark, we are liar. Our father's descent has made us the evil one, and we are on a stool. There are no differentiated words for what would be interior, so it rises, thundering waves constricting our throat, 
choked scream flailing arm and we remember when we before sat on the stool within the secret linings of her interior chamber and we were marked father not law which derives from repression of desire for mother also is mother's desire yet father shattered in her womb pushing us further down until we spoke out of it which took us to where we are told our desire is yet uneducated. She has a creed, and for her the rising sensations from marginal regions are not unnameable. Learning through repetition, we are again on the stool, and he is bearing down on us. Quote, what my sensations were no language can describe, end quote. Our eruption threatens yet another suffocation as we are going under the waves or formless have long-weighted articulation. Quote, what my sensations were, no language can describe, but just as they all rose, stifling my breath and constricting my throat, a girl came up and passed me. In passing, she lifted her eyes, end quote. When we think we have no language to describe what rises, she comes up and passes us with a ray sensate, as it penetrates, it holds. Jane on stool is mortified. She is being flayed. She knows she may shatter, break open. The stool is the place of holding tensions, inherent contradictions. That is, the red room is not a lie. I am here because it is a lie. Where what can no longer be discharged according to reactivity impulse can hold. Holding our stool discharge is decentered desire, which is Helen's moment that possibly there can be a language mediating this experience. Not repression of desire to derive word, yet differentiation of our desire through word. Not to discharge impulsively is to hold the violence, the splittings at the root of the discharge, which her intelligent ray sees and penetrates. For our humiliation has indicated, we are a distinct body. We see ourselves from the exterior as their inferior. We no longer need impulse discharge to establish an experience of separation. Yet it threatens to act out for the public view, confirming it, confirming that the only way we can be separate is to carry their negative, reflect it back to them, ashamed. Divisor out of dividend through the Brocklehurst humiliation, but threatens to go under in the same way and not divide through to quotient and remainder fraction. What her gaze now communicates is that we do not have to know ourselves only from exterior, acting their castaway to separate and perform the lowwood division. The way the waves of rising sensations could rend, could shatter, she holds in her gaze back our body differentiating. Helen is who holds our heterogeneous body in the stool moment through a gaze that shows understanding of the shattering. Her gaze is not a unification of our rupturing or a demand of its coalescence in any way, yet in, it imparts to us that the violence inherent in the currents rising to our constricted throat can be messaged. For Jane sitting on the stool is experiencing what she senses cannot be expressed or named, quote, no language can describe, end quote. Her throat constricts what she cannot speak, what is beyond herself from other worlds, death worlds, window seat, red room, nursery, all of it, and the waves rising to submerge her back to them, threaten her very existence she believes cannot be spoken, that there is no solidifying substance to speak or a language through which it can be imparted. The way Brocklehurst sadism has allowed Jane to see her body as distinct is a preparation for Helen who posits Jane's writing the violence inherent in the rising sensations. Helen's interior eye peering to the vista of angel and Christ has emerged from mortified body. 
mortified the pleasures and she lets the interior regions form themselves and she becomes heterogeneous body, not only of this world, yet Northumberland and the regions of Charles I. No flooding necessary. She knows her mishap, locates her errors and lets them shatter her to interior realms. She finds there a natural inhibition temperance, not submission. Helen correctly and empathetically perceives Jane's interior devastated state, the violence is there, and she communicates that by various bodily languages of her stance, smile, and eye. In Helen's bodily response and reflective gaze are the beginning articulations of Jane's interior world. And this articulation Word, wordless yet, allows the tumult to subside because Helen's gaze indicates that from the exterior, Jane's interior world and its violence exist, is real, has a form which can be perceived and communicated back. The Brocklehurst Lowood flock looked at a reflection of what they shunned she was their interior rejected waste reflected back to them so they could split from it. As Jane almost became or acted out the flocks rejected, Helen reflected Jane's interior. Helen's gaze is not a direct mirroring exterior reflection as it is a reflection of Jane's potential interior seeing, calm, lit, intimately containing. Empathy passage of angels, quote, reflection from the aspect of an angel, end quote. Helen's mirroring gaze is through angels, angelos, those who emerge from primordial waves beyond pleasure, beyond human, and linked to death, and the mortification of who would fuse in collective body univocal, who are messengers to speak messages of those waves beyond life, not centered on the human, decentered human, which is to be bore up as human, not impulsive. Quote, firm stand on the stool, end quote. These sensations rising each a wave in its own right with message, distinct voices, are how her aspect is of angel reflecting. Helen stands at the place beyond what attempts to restrain the waves, more of angel, of, quote, effluence of fine intellect, end quote, knows these waves passing through her from marginal worlds closer to where we will be at death. The other worlds of non-being, which infiltrated at Gateshead, reflected by Red Room Mirror, now we are a continuity of being, here on the stool a human being, reflected by Mr. Lloyd and separated out through Brocklehurst. And the other world has risen to angel, sublime aspect of angel, and its ray penetrates, goes through us. Yet we remain sitting there, and it does not take us. She does not remove us from the stool, since the stool is the way to move beyond temporary and impulsive discharge. Helen's presence allows us to sit as waves from without, unconscious, move within and rise. They do not submerge us, yet rise through us, sublime. Helen, sublimation is not eradication of these waves which resonate off the impact of the Reed and Brocklehurst forces, yet mediation, refinement, rise to message, possibility, interior, even of language. Brocklehurst is a preparation for Helen if we do not stop with him which would be to split and discharge against him, which would be to be ever fused with Mrs. Reed, still fused with that impulse, Reed, Brocklehurst, and company of that mother. Helen is stronger than Brocklehurst because she has less fear than he of what emerges from margins unknown, non-human, and of what curls. Helen's gaze penetrates, but it is not voyeuristic, objectifying, phallocentric or sadistically possessive. Nor is her ray of vapor ethereal. It is sensational, 
sends an extraordinary sensation through us, penetrates our body, filling it. We are buoyed and shored. Her refinement embodies us. Helen is that interior gaze to Jane. How Jane's interior containing impulses looks lit, smiles, offers an otherness, yet not through sadism, yet an otherness intimately contained. To have an occasion to see our interior intimately reflected otherwise is erotic. We sit still, rising. What was unconscious in the back rooms of recess is rising. And as it is a public affair, it remains quite private between us. Kindly, she is meeting us in a touch of eyes, now smiles from embrace. And suddenly, it is quite private, and they do not matter. We have risen to this embrace, great, greatly thrilled, slowly remove our gates head clothing, those layers crumbling at stool's foot. We rise to this stripping. Now we take a firm stand on the stool and the breathing becomes easier. In low with the Brocklehurstian mode is depotentiated. Teacher even smiles, students grimace, his ladies flaunt and waddle. The one would repress these desires, unconscious waves rising prohibited, is also the one who proclaims our red room experience a lie. For he would have the agency of that father, high, father's law derived from the repression of desires. Yet we were in there and we experienced that father's crash, father suppressed in mother's red room stifling us. When Brocklehurst is depotentiated, Helen passes by. Far from suppressing them, she knows these desires are uneducated, want articulation. Helen can pull through us, designate by the language of her gaze and her smile that by which we are being gripped. What Brocklehurst denounced, lie, Helen rises to a public view, yet in metaphoric holding. Helen offers signifying function for these unconscious waves rising, holds their message in her passing. So we go through Brocklehurst to arrive distinct stool body. We cannot find Helen passing until we are stool separate. We can hold these waves and their inherent tension would rupture through what was not solid containing substance. The place where stepmother's Brocklehurstian sadism severed us to know our difference, boundary, in the lowered place of high-walled propriety is where father attempts to remain high. Glory stone tablet in the name of Brocklehurst yet ultimately is where that father's word of law fails to dominate, split from repressed desire. Lowood is where father's law, glory father, tablet, passes to Helen, Helen's reading. In Lowood, she passes by, her passing a possibility we can remain on stool, demarcated not by impulsive release, yet sublimated until what rises unconscious become message of angels. She knows our discord, the way we have ruptured, even been shattered, their heterogeneous body opening to the realm of death, interior life, the home. Beginning an empathy for our heterogeneous selves, our many sides divided. After sadism, we are divided, and we see this other one with many sides, her untidy badge alongside her effluent visage. We let Brocklehurst's whipping hold, go, as we are held by Hel Helen's smile, penetrated by her ray. There are many sides to it. Held by Helen's intelligence, at the same moment she wears the untidy badge. More empathetically, we can see the differentiated parts as well as their relation. Defect is of human limit. The angel as messenger through our defect how the one of defect, the bad girl, is also of angels, angelos, message of the badness, angel of the evil agent, message of our mark, how we are heterogeneous and not split, multifaceted nature. Mortified, we begin to see what the natural division indeed resides beneath the gate's head layers.
Hysteria is that divided nature not knowing or speaking itself, trying to constrict itself back to place, back to a self, wanting its pleasure, one human self, but not held by a penetrating gaze to empathetically place its differentiated nature. Instead of lowering to waves, rising possibility of distinct language, the sensations choked a throat. A throat still of the law said difference is evil interloper, must be excluded, shut out, cast off, cut off. Through her light, extraordinary ray, the effluence of smiles, she reflects the passion of the stool place, penetrating through us, impassioning, which is her empathy, which holds us up. We begin to learn we can transmit the language of the waves, a language of the unconscious. When the hysteric screams, here's a plea for another to find her stool. She is resisting a stool sitting where she feels most out of herself, where she longs yet fears to be part of the flock, and when the only way to be distinct is out of herself humiliated, public eye disgrace. When the hysteric screams, here's a plea for another to look for the parts disavowed, whipped in accusation as she stands, only exterior split herself, fear of those rising depths. The temptation within the hysteric scream is to remain with Brocklehurst, not marble to him, yet absorbing his contagion in condemning her, contribution to his whipping petrified of the waves accumulating in every scream. To get tempted by Brocklehurst is to say it is an act. She is lying. It is intentional, deceptive, dramatic, which would be to reduce it to a deliberate human will when she is flailing because with a nascent sense of distinct body, she also finally is beyond where there is not any human-centric gratification. To remember through the hysterical scream what it is to sink with no air forthcoming, only the crashing about what angels to inform what is the form? Design, each wave comes its distinct design, and we transmit this intelligence to the woman on the stool. It cannot at first be in words, since she is drowning. The words cannot be heard, but our stance, our eye, this smile, sometimes our sigh, or the long, ch low chanting from the depths of any ocean. Helen is divided from us, separate, yet she reflects our interior. Therefore, her passing signals we can know, empathize with, our internal divisions. After Helen's passing, Jane is struck and bore up, quote, what an extraordinary sensation that ray sent through me. How the new feeling bore me up, end quote. The one who can see our divisions and how they have been based on violence is our divided self. Helen's holding does not gratify. It does not remove Jane from the stool. Jane's stool space is to mortify into the divided parts without being stopped by Brocklehurst, yet separating through him. Jane is on her own, yet held. Sitting in fragmented yet divided parts while held together by their inherent relation. Helen's passing holds both the differentiation, even the shattering, as well as the inherent relation. And this holding of such contradiction becomes our humility. Also, in no way does Helen sweeten the stool suffering. Her air and light provide the refining passage, so Jane can strip the gateshead layers, sitting shameful, becoming mortified. Jane now is not rent, but parting from Gateshead choices into her own multifaceted nature, contained as dividing upon the stool. Angels behind, around, even penetrating her, and she can take off the layers, divided, let the depths of the mother's ever feared rise to this natural division on her own as accompanied. <coughs> Helen's mode of humility this transition of the Brocklehurstian humiliation to Helen's humility is not submission. Our stand is firm, no buckling on the stool, differentiated yet related. 
Brocklehurst as master is depotentiated as we sit in our own defects, that inferior position when the unconscious breaks its waves through us and we feel fragmented, shattered, ashamed. As we sit in this place, accept it with Helen's passing hold, depotentiated Brocklehurst is our humility and is how we are master. The master collapses as we accept our inferiorities while holding on what was unconscious passing through, which makes us the master. Some Brocklehurst force negotiated, quote, I mastered the rising hysteria, end quote. Because reacting to Brocklehurst in a hysteria would have been a passive submission, as active as it may have appeared. Helen of angels is not a passivity nor is a passivity the humility to which her passing invites us. Her ray penetrates. Girl with a sunken eye has a driving force penetrating. Our humility has derived from Brocklehurst's depotentiation in front of students and teachers through his ludicrous attack on the red curl, as well as the blatancy of his asceticism seen through the artificial adornment of his wife and daughters. The whole prohibiting master, also binding us to Mrs. Reed, is let down as Jane sits in the midst of her own human fragility and a nature soiled, that she has been possessed and rent by agents of evil, and she has lost her appetite. Her long division slate has been split she sits amidst the fragmented pieces calmed and reflected by the light of the curl of a smile. So this ends my lyrical analysis of chapter seven. Thank you for listening.